Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining our webinar this afternoon, Steam Sterilizer and Autoclave Qualification, a deep dive into steam quality testing, protocol development, and development runs. My name is Andrew Bourdon. A uh, quick, uh, few quick items before we get started. Um, there'll be a question and answer session um, at the end of today's panel discussion. If you have a question you would like our panel to answer, um, please submit them in the question box on the control panel on the right side of your screen at any time. Toward the bottom of the control panel, you'll also see a handout section um, where we included uh, PDFs of uh, the slides for today and also a companion white paper that you can download. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and you'll get a recording uh, sent to you uh, via email within uh, 24 hours. Um, now I'd like to introduce our chief presenter, uh, Rod Briggs, uh, who will introduce the panel today. All right, thank you, Andrew. So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Rob Briggs. I am one of the validation and business development managers for Massey Bioservices. I've been with Massey for four plus years and I've been uh, in the industry for 25 years. And at this point, I'll hand it over to Sylvan to introduce himself. Thanks, Rob. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Sylvan Polk. I'm the validation director for Massey's office located in Pennsylvania. Uh, we're in the Mid-Atlantic region. I've been with Massey now almost 10 years and I've been in the industry for about 25, uh, 20 of which have been uh, directly involved in uh, performing validation and providing validation services. Hi, and uh, thank you. And I'm John Masiello, uh, co-founder, uh, executive vice president of Masi. I've been uh, with the company for 32 years and I have, or 35 years, and I have 32 years experience with sterilization, validation, along with numerous other facets of validation. Antoine? Thank you, John. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Juan Nguyen. I am the validation manager at Massey's California branch. Um, I've been with Massey for almost four years now, and I have over seven years of industry experience with a wide range of validation. Um, I'm going to jump the discussion to today's uh, webinar agenda. Um, as, as a recap to our last webinar on autoclaves and sterilizers, we went into six different types of sterilization processes. Um, as a process to which we went over. Um, first is ethylene oxide. Um, it is the most common sterilization technique that is performed for medical devices as it's a low temperature gas process, so it won't damage the medical devices. Um, it's basically used to sterilize heat and moisture sensitive devices that would otherwise be damaged by pure steam or pure uh, next, we get into gamma sterilization, which is performed by exposing the product to a radiation source. Um, these gamma rays can penetrate the product and deactivate any microorganisms that there may be. Um, next, we go to vapor hydrogen peroxide sterilization, which very similar to ethylene oxide is used for medical devices, and it uses a high vacuum, low temperature vapor process to sterilize uh, types of medical devices. We get into dry heat sterilization sterilization which works with dry air. Um, it's mainly used to destroy pyrogens and is used to sterilize items that may be otherwise be damaged by heat, which we see in steam or autoclave sterilization. Um, next we get into filtration sterilization, which is a sterilization technique that is used instead of destroying organism, we instead remove them using a filtration process. And then lastly we get into steam or Moist heat sterilization, which we'll get deeper into in this presentation. Um, I'm going to pass it back to Rob to discuss um, the focus on today. Excellent. Thank you, Tuan. All right. So, yeah, so today's focus, as you can see on here, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start with a deep dive into uh, steam quality testing. Uh, we're going to hit upon protocol development. And then, last but not least, we'll talk about uh, or do more of a deeper dive into cycle development. So before we do that, though, let's have our first poll. So Andrew, could you uh, get that first poll running for us? Sure, absolutely, Rob. So you should see that come up on your screen momentarily. So excellent. So our first question, uh, what is your experience with steam quality testing? And the options are my company performs it 
internally. Um, my company hires an outside vendor to perform them, or you know, I'm new and I don't have uh, experience with those things. So I'll give you a few seconds to um, to answer those questions. Um, we appreciate your input because we do use these uh, not only to guide the conversation, you know, in today's webinar, um, but we also use that to help um, select uh, new topics for future webinars uh, that you might be interested in. So let's give it another five or 10 seconds here, and then we'll look at the results together. So, all right, so it looks like uh, most popular choices right now are um, hiring outside vendor or uh, a lot of new people too, which is great. So I'm gonna close the voting and We'll look at the results here together. So, excellent. So we got a good uh, good spread. So uh, diverse audience here. 29% um, of uh, people um, have on-site uh, internal staff uh, to handle uh, steam quality validations. Um, similar amount, slightly more, um, use an outside vendor to perform the work, which is you know very common. And surprisingly, uh, about a third of you are looking to learn more, so that's that's excellent. We like uh, we like to see all those things. So I'll pass it back over to Rob, and we'll uh, move forward talking about uh, steam quality uh, testing and planning. So it should show up for you guys in you just got it. one yep, moment. I see it now. Thank you, Andrew. You're all right. Uh, so we're going to start with planning on uh, steam quality testing. Again, this is going to be a little bit deeper dive into uh, what we had uh, presented back uh, one of our last webinars where we went over autoclaves. And uh, this is going to maybe go in a little bit deeper than what we did with that there. So uh, to start off with planning, uh, we're going to go through the what, the who, the why, the when, and let's start with the what. Sylvan, can you tell us what it is? Uh, certainly, Rob. So steam quality testing is a process of uh, evaluating the uh, physical properties of the steam to make sure that it is appropriately supporting the sterilization process that it's being used for. So when we perform a steam quality test, there are three characteristics that we're uh, testing or measuring. Uh, the first is we're testing for non-condensable gases. What we're looking for basically is that we have gases other than uh, water in the steam supply um, and typically that's going to be atmospheric air um, the things that make up our air um, oxygen carbon dioxide etc uh, we don't want those things to be in the steam uh, they will um, at greater amounts limit the effectiveness of the steam in providing lethality uh, the second test that we do is for superheat so we're basically making sure that the steam is at, a, at an appropriate temp above its boiling point um, at a given temperature um, we want to have that steam actually uh, phase change and condensate when it's uh, uh, entering the sterilization environment um, and superheat if it exceeds uh, uh, the temperature is, is, is in excess of what it should be, um, it, will, it will interfere with that uh, being effectively done. Um, superheat is also something that can be produced as a result of an excessive pressure drop also. So there's a um, criteria there that we want to make sure the steam will meet. And then the third parameter is dryness. So we're measuring the steam to make sure that there isn't an excessive amount of liquid water in the steam. We want that steam to be gas phase. Um, that will be uh, measured to within a certain parameter so that we know that we're getting a, a gas phase steam uh, versus a lot of liquid or condensate uh, into the sterilization environment. Uh, back to you, Rob. All right, thank you, Sylvan. So who needs this testing performed? And I can tell you that it's, it's a requirement for those that manufacture or uh, the processes or process, process or, <laughs> I can't say that for processes or, uh, I processes, I'm not going to get it. Anyways, it, it's the, it's the main factors for those who put together uh, a lot of the sterile products that are out there. And it's for anybody who's selling uh, to overseas um, uh, to, uh, to the European Union. Um, so those are the, generally the folks who have to do it, but uh, there's certainly there's guidances out there and regulations out there, uh, guys, that's related to it. 
The big one we're going to talk about today will be EN285, which is for large steam sterilizers. There's also uh, EN, which is a European norm, uh, 13060. That's for small steam sterilizers. Uh, there's HDM uh, 0101, used to be HDM 2010 back in the day. Uh, that also as well for medical devices. And then there's also guidance out there uh, here that we follow inside the US if, if you're following a PDA, so the Mental Drug Association uh, for Tech Report 1 or Tech Report uh, 48. And Tech Report 1 will be going over a little bit more later on because it has some great stuff around psychedelics. Uh, so on to the why, John. Why is this performed? Sure. Well, one of the reasons is the steam quality testing is performed to verify the uh, steam uh, supply assures product sterility. It's a requirement for manufacturers and processors of sterile products uh, within the European community, and it's a logical practice in the steam sterilization sector. You, know, you want to remove excess uh, non condensable gases, as air is an ex excellent insulator. You don't want that. Essential to have uh, adequate moisture to facilitate the denaturing of the proteins and coagulation of the cell walls. All right. Superheated steam will act as a hot air until the temperature drops to a boiling point. Otherwise, the cycle will require longer holding times, if you don't know that. Right? And excess moisture in the steam can cause wet loads and potential for reinfection of the product. It's got to be dry when we're done. Antoine? Thanks, John. Um, I'll be going over the when and where it is performed. Uh, we'll start with where. Typically, the steam is tested directly at the steam supply line near the generator, which can be considered as the proximal port, or at the point of use of the, auto, of the sterilizer autotype, which may be considered the distal port. Um, it ultimately, ultimately depends on what system you have and what ac access points you really have available for you to tap into. But um, the conservative approach would be to test at the point of use at the sterilizer or the autoclave, as you're testing the steam right before it contacts your equipment or items you want sterilized. Um, in regards to when, you'll want to test your steam before any initial qualification or requalification of your autoclave, as you want to make sure that your steam meets the required EN285 requirements before moving forward with any qualification. Um, if your steam does not meet the regulation requirements as followed, then it may waste your autoclave qualification if it isn't conducted before, as, again, you may have issues with the quality of your steam. And I'm going to pass it back to you, Rob. All right. Thank you, Tuan. All right. So on to execution of the plan. Uh, so before we begin anything, safety first, right? So John, can you talk about the safety precautions we, we would uh, we would do before? Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Always observe your safety rules and your SOPs. Right? You'll be connecting into a live system. Take proper precautions with facility teams to isolate your work area. Utilize thermally insulated gloves and safety glasses. Make sure all connections are snug and tight. Not only dealing with, with, with high temperatures, but pressures as well. The system will be hot, be aware. Thank you. And Sylvan, what equipment do we need? Thanks, John. So um, if, are we able to back up to the earlier slide? Yeah, that would be great. That way, so not only yep. the equipment, but maybe a little bit of the how as well, how things mm -hmm. are done. Please. Certainly. So. The, um, so the equipment we use, uh, some of it is pictured right here, and I'll describe what you're looking at. Uh, that metal pipe that's near the bottom, that's a spool piece that we attach that's uh, 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 supplied with sanitary fittings. So we, uh, when we locate the steam supply line, we connect that test pipe onto the steam supply, and there are a couple of additional connection points provided. So we utilize those to actually uh, extract steam from the system. So right there where that red dot is pointing to, that's a supply line that goes into a condenser, which I'll uh, speak to in a minute. And then the other two uh, connections that are near the front, um, one goes to an expansion device that we use for testing for superheat. And then another one is to bring a thermocouple into the line so that we can measure the temperature of the steam. And then the bottom larger sanitary connection is for a uh, steam trap. Uh, so that we uh, have a way of removing condensate from the system while we're actually collecting our steam. Um, so in addition to those uh, components, you'll see a fluke uh, temperature meter there with a couple of thermocouples, uh, which are calibrated, and they are used to uh, measure the temperature uh, to support the testing that we're doing. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. 
So what John was just talking about was safety, by the way, that's a very important thing when we're hooking up that test pipe is to make sure we're doing that safely. Uh, and we do have a small orifice on there that's uh, allowing steam to escape. So these are additional components that we use now shown on this slide. To the left, uh, there is a thermos that actually is a thermos. Um, it uh, is used for the dryness test and the hose that you see coming out of the top is connected to that steam supply through that small pitot tube orifice that comes out of the test pipe we looked at earlier. And then the uh, calibrated balance below is used to measure uh, what we're basically doing is we're evaluating the quantity of water that's collected in the, um, in the thermos when we're doing the dryness test. There's uh, also a large device there that's shown, which is our condenser. So that is used for the non-condensable gases testing. Uh, internally, what that device does is it condenses the steam. So it is hooked up to that test pipe that we showed earlier. And internally, it condenses that steam and is able to separate the water from any non-condensable gases that are present. The non-condensable gases will collect in that um, in the uh, uh, tube there that's in the center of the device. And then you will have a, a graduated cylinder on the right-hand side, which will collect the water that comes out. And we compare those two measurements to see where the non-condensable gases are at. So that describes the equipment, um, kind of talking about the how a little bit. So, um, you know, I think I went over that a bit there, but basically those, those devices are, are attached and they're used to uh, run the three tests that we have. Um, and yeah, I think I think I kind of covered that pretty well as we went yeah, through each other. So. So the, the, one, the one point, uh, how, how many uh, sets of tests do we do for each one of these? Yes, thank you. So each time we run a test, we do it three times. Uh, we need to have three successive passing results for the steam quality test to be successful for those three types of tests that we're doing. So it's you could look at it as nine runs total. Each test is done three times in a row. Great, great, great. Thank you. And, and we'll be talking in a minute or so a little bit more about the uh, results and analyzing those. Uh, the last bullet point that's on here is on contaminants. Uh, so if you look at EN-285, there's Annex B and there's also Table 4. Uh, within those, it does talk about contaminants and it's talking about the feed water and it's also talking about the clean steam condensate as well being tested uh, for, for many different things, whether it's lead, whether it's endotoxin. Um, anyways, those, those tables are within the EN-285. They're also listed in uh, HDM-0101 and they're listed in that... Uh, EN 13060 document that I mentioned earlier as well. All right, so let's move on. Uh, we'll move on to uh, the analyzing the results. And Twan, would you be able to go over the uh, analyzing of the results? Yes, I will be able to, Rob. Um, to add on and reiterate to John and Silvin's statements earlier about the test, we'll, deep, we'll dive deep into the acceptance criteria and results of each team body test. Um, the first one we'll go over is condensable gas testing. The idea behind the test is to analyze how much air or other gases is in your line, as Sylvan stated earlier. If there's too much gases or air in your steam line, you, then you may get false sterilization as they are poor, poor sterilization. Um, the asymptos criteria per EN-285 um, for non condensable gas testing is less than or equal to 3.5% by volume of non condensable gases. So if you have 100 milliliters of condensate, then your non condensable gases, your, ga your air or whatever has to be 3.5 milliliters or less. Um, next is dryness testing. The logic behind dryness testing is to test how the how wet the steam is. If the steam is too wet, the sterilization assurance level will most likely not be met, and you may get false sterility. In order to meet EN 25's criteria, you need a dryness level of 95% or more by weight. And then lastly, we'll dive deep into superheat, which is the temperature of steam above the temperature of saturated steam for the moisture content. Um, basically, if the temperature is too high above the moisture content, then you may experience melting or damages to your equipment you desire to sterilize, which is meant dry heat sterilization. Um, the sometimes criteria for superheat per EN-285 is less than or equal to 25 degrees Celsius. These tests, again, require passing results in triplicate to support sterility in regards to proving consistency and reproducibility. Um, I'm now going to pass it back to Rob to discuss recommendations for steam quality testing. All right, excellent. And John, uh, first question uh, is for requalification, how often? Well, it, it's recommended to do annually. 
and uh, and also uh, to, to consider that if there's any changes in uh, the steam supply line, the system, the generator, something that can impact the quality, and uh, that's why it, you, you would pull that in sooner then. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I got both uh, Sylvan and Twan here. You guys have been doing a lot of steam quality testing over the past uh, four years or so with, with us. And I wanted to ask here just around failures, near failures or experiences. And, and Sylvan, I'll have you go first if you have an experience that you could share uh, on steam quality testing. Uh, certainly. Uh, the one that seems to stick out the most for me um, as being troublesome is the non-condensable gas test. Um, it, it's uh, something that can you can reveal a problem in the steam generation and, and delivery system, especially when uh, a site is trying to now achieve you know EN 285 compliance and they're testing a system that's you know was designed a long time ago um, is, is older. And, uh, and now, you know, you're, you're actually for the first time performing a test on that system. So I've, you know, I've seen non-condensable gases be challenging. Um, the thing to do really is to start looking at what are the, what are the ways that you could have air or, or gases, you know, things other than actual water uh, being introduced into the steam system. So obviously you go right back to where you're generating the steam, but even, you know, even upstream from that, your feed water, um, all of those things can contribute to um, having an issue with non-condensable gases, so um, it's um, important also to look at other components on the uh, on the distribution system, right? I mean, if, if you have valves with pneumatic actuators and you have uh, you know air, you know, bleeding through the actuators on the valves, for example, so there's a lot of troubleshooting that basically uh, starts once you recognize that you have that issue. But that is the one that I seem to encounter the most. And that basically you have to go back and look at the entire system and see where it is um, that you're, that that air is being introduced. And uh, really that starts right at the beginning with the feed water that comes in. Okay, great, thank you. All right, let's 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 move on. We're gonna move into uh, protocol development. So that was our steam quality section and uh, we completed that. So this is gonna be a more of a condensed uh, piece here that we're gonna talk about. Um, anybody might wanna mute. <laughs> Um, so on protocol development itself, uh, what we want to do is we want to give you at least a high level idea of, you know, building a protocol. If, if you're starting from scratch or maybe maybe you're uh, more of a seasoned veteran and, uh, and you're good to go. The main point design of your sterilizer and, and having the right sterilizer for the right process is, is really the key. Making sure that you can actually control some of the things that you're, you're looking to control um, that are there. But it all starts with getting a URS. You need to know the user requirement specifications for, for your autoclave. Uh, that, that, is, that is key when you're going to be writing up your protocol. You need to know where, where you guys are going, what you're planning to do. Uh, you need to know what your company's, uh, what, what the company's goals are. The company is selling overseas. Uh, you know, if you have regulations that you need to follow and the company needs to follow, uh, those industry standards, those are, those are very important and they need to be put into that protocol as well. Uh, some companies, a lot of larger and moderate sized companies have uh, validation master plans. That's the VMP that's listed there as well as policies. So they, they already have a lot of this stuff built in. They'll tell you a lot of things that you need to have inside of your protocol. But say you're a small company just starting out, you have a sterilizer, maybe you know what the user wants, but you don't know how to write that protocol. There's a few different things that you can do that, that, are, that are helpful. And uh, one of those would be uh, getting the vendor operation and maintenance manual, that one. The other piece could be that the vendors themselves, a lot of these sterilization or sterilizer manufacturers do have IQO queues as well. So maybe you save the time that way and you have them uh, create the I and the OQ for you. Um, when you get more into what we're gonna be talking about later, it's gonna be more into cycle development, you're moving towards PQ. Um, anyways. Um, just a few general things, John. I'm going to kick it over to you around protocol layout and some things that you maybe you mm -hmm. feel practice. So, uh, could you take it away? Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Sure. Make it easy to read and review. Okay. Execute. All right. Utilize the table of contents. We've seen a number of them without that. Very important to have it. Along with the attachments, define it with tabs for easy reference back and forth. We know we have to go through the reports all the time. Tell a story that's clear, concise, and organized. And consider a template format, you know? Keep it simple. 
Thank you, Rob. Um, on, the, on the last bullet point on that, um, where we talked about electronic protocol, Twine, could you speak about that just for a moment? Yeah, sure thing, Rob. Um, we're getting into the new age of validation where electronic protocols are being more commonly used at companies. In regards to more complex validations, um, complete, such as autoclave sterilizer, qualifi or qualifi sterilizer qualifications, electronic protocols help tremendously with efficiency as well as organization with equipment that require a ton of documents such as SOPs, FATs, SATs, BMPs, URSs, financial risk assessments, and protocols. An electronic protocol program helps to keep everything organized in one area, as well as making as well as well as makes the review, execution, and approval stages more streamlined. Um, I've used an e-protocol system myself, and I've seen how efficient they can make the, the validation processes. And I can see that this is the way of the future. Um, Next, uh, Silvan, can you go over what should be covered in the IT part of the autoclave protocol? Uh, certainly, Tuan. So I, IQ installation qualification is uh, very important. Um, it's a lot of uh, documentation. Uh, there's uh, the manuals. Uh, you want to make sure that you are collecting um, all of the information about the system. So you want to make sure that you have the uh, operating and maintenance manual. You want to make sure that you have um, your diagrams, your component, you know, list of your components, a spare part list, uh, cut sheets, etc. All of the important documentation that comes with that system, and then uh, so you're collecting that as part of the uh, uh, defined activities in the IQ. And then additionally, you want to check for the uh, physical appearance and condition of the sterilizer. Make sure that it's installed properly, that it has sufficient space, that it's in a in an, in an appropriate location. Um, that it's uh, you know um, installed you know per the manufacturer specification. Uh, there's also a um, utilities that are going to feed your sterilizer that you want to make sure are installed and providing proper service to the machine as well. So if you're uh, relying on plant steam, you'll have a plant steam supply coming into your autoclave, or you'll bring you'll be bringing in feed water if it has its own boiler um, that it that it utilizes to generate steam. Um, you might also have process air for, for some of your uh, pneumatics, um, valve actuators, et cetera. So all of those need to be verified to make sure they're meeting requirements, that they can deliver the utility properly. Um, the autoclave is also a pressure vessel, obviously, so um, that should have a certification that should also be uh, verified as part of the IQ. And uh, again, uh, making sure that you have all the things that you need to properly operate and maintain that, that uh, the piece of equipment. So a lot, a lot of parts on a sterilizer. So component list, um, also, um, you know, operating uh, uh, instructions for uh, replacement uh, schedules of parts and ma maintenance and stuff like that, too. Uh, back to you, Rob. Thank you. All right. Sorry about that. So, Andrew, back up to the uh, back up to the uh, the last slide. I need to go to OQ and PQ. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, one thing I wanted to mention before we jump into into OQ two is it, it's really important to get the if you have a QA group and a validation group uh, and you're looking to purchase a sterilizer, or say you're the end user and you're not, uh, you know, usually it's not validation or QA that's involved with the with that, but get them involved early on. Uh, when you are when you're planning on doing this, because all this whole process will go by much smoother if you can have QA in your validation group uh, on board early on. All right, on to uh, OQ uh, and Twan. Can you give us a, a flavor for what we would have as part of the OQ uh, for a sterilized autoclave? Sure thing, Rob. Um, when building a protocol for an autoclave OQ, uh, there are standard tests performed to ensure your autoclave is operating properly before your PQ or your performance qualification phase. Um, typically, OQs will cover alarm interlock testing, in which you want to test all alarms that are stated in the manufacturer's manual. Um, you want to make sure that they're all working properly in case you're alerted during any cycle runs that may have any issues, and that inform you if you need to rerun them or not. Um, and you will also conduct the empty chamber mapping, which is a very important step in the cycle development phase, as this is where you'll find out where your chamber code spot is that you'll need for your PQ load item runs later on. It is recommended with, um, that you run these in triplicates, similar to what we discussed earlier on steam quality testing, as you want to ensure consistent and reproducible results in regards to your code spot. 
Um, in regards to low queue, it's also important to run air detector tests or Bowie detect detect tests, especially if you're running vacuum cycles, um, as this is to evaluate and verify the performance of your pre-vacuum um, autoclave. Um, and making sure that it can provide adequate air removal before you run any, any of your cycles. Um, in the OQ, it's also important to run vacuum leak tests, which is only applicable if you're using a thermocool feed-through adapter, which we'll discuss later, uh, discuss more later on uh, for your autoclave qualification runs. Um, the vacuum leak test would be conducted after you break into your autoclave line, as well as after you remove the thermocouple feed-through adapter to ensure that the integrity of the autoclave did not change in between any of the tests that you ran. Um, the vacuum leak test is not required when you're using wireless sensors, as the autoclave line would not have to be broken into to get your sensors in. Um, now, John's going to discuss the next step of the protocol building phase, which is the PQ portion. Hi, thank you, uh, Tuan. So. What we have on the PQ is either, well, you, you select either the fixed loads or the mixed loads and considering the bracketing approach for the mixed loads. Uh, you utilize the results from the OQ cycle considering the hottest and the coldest locations within the chamber that Tuan was talking about. And then the best practice is the triplicate. And we'll get further into the different loads and how uh, in a few slides from now. Okay, great. Thank you, John. All right, up to our second. Starting with you, Rob. One thing I want to mention too, I just realized we didn't mention it, um, and it's very important, is uh, getting those uh, instruments on that sterilizer calibrated. So prior to going yes. into OQ, running those studies, you know, running the uh, mm -hmm. the sterilizer, make sure all of your instruments that are providing control function or monitoring function, right, going out to your printout, uh, that those are properly calibrated before you you get started with that. Sorry to jump in. Thanks. No, no, no. That, that, that's, yeah. that's a great point. <laughs> yeah, great point. <laughs> All right, Andrew, can you hit up the second poll for us, please? Sure, absolutely. So it should show up on everybody's screen momentarily. So, all right, so the second question, uh, what is your experience with cycle development? And the options are, you know, very experienced, just looking to see how other people are doing it. Um, or I have some experience um, looking to pick up some uh, some tips and best practices uh, to improve. Um, or, you know, I'm brand new to this and I'm, you know, I'm just looking to learn more. So we'll give everybody a little bit of time uh, to do that. And uh, <clears throat> so results are coming in. Um, looks like most people are have some to no experience, um, but we do have a few people who do have a bunch of experience, so um, be sure to put your uh, questions in the uh, chat. So that could be a great, uh, great way to inform the conversation uh, when we get to that. So going to publish your results. So yeah, um, almost half uh, had some experience. Um, fully half are brand new, and about six percent of you are very experienced. So, which is which is awesome. So, um, Rob, I will hand it back to you here, and then we'll move on to cycle development planning. Great, thank you, Andrew. Okay, uh, so like protocol development, uh, you'll need to know what your sterilizer is, is capable of. The control of it's going to be extremely important. Uh, you need to know what you know how it's developed and how it's going going to be. If you're trying to meet specifications, especially the specifications that we were talking about. Um, before inside of EU or EN uh, 285, there's a lot of little things inside of there that you need to uh, to be able to meet. Uh, give you an example, um, the equilibration time, uh, depending on the size sterilizer that you have, you either have 15 or you have 30 seconds for yourself to be able to hit that. Cycle development is extremely important in that case. Even if you have a sterilizer that you know at your site that has been able to perform it before, any new sterilizer might have a little bit different uh, controls around it or, or different, you know, different systems. Maybe the PID valves a little bit different. There's just so many little differences that you do want to test it out. And you might have to find out during OQ that, that you need to do some tweaking. But uh, you definitely, by the time you, you, you get it up and running through commissioning, cycle development is going to be very key to that, right? Because you can, you can work with vacuum pulses and you can work with uh, or scheme pulses in the vacuum pull downs. 
anyways, uh, cycle design, uh, great reference for cycle design for, for anybody out there. Inside of uh, PDA Tech Report 1, there's a lot on cycle design there. It really breaks it into two parts. It takes, uh, takes you into either the overkill approach, where you got a cell of 12, right? You're working with uh, biological indicators at uh, 10 to the minus 6, but then you make sure that you do one better than that, and you bring it out and you double up that time to be able to kill those and get, get that cell of 12. That, that's one way to do it. That's a lot of your glassware and, uh, and wrap goods type cycles. And that's, I'd say, you know, in what we see, I'd say it's a large percentage of what we see for the type of, uh, of cycle design. On the other hand, you could have something that's more like an auger that's out there that is uh, very process specific, right? You want to do the sterilization to the auger. However, you don't want to uh, denature it to a point where it's not going to work. Um, so those are really the two pieces, cycle design to start. It's usually, um, usually either overkill or it's going to be that uh, product specific. And there's a great table inside of PEA Tech Report 1. If anybody's interested, it's inside there. It gives you a nice flow chart as to, as to ways you can go about this. All right, Sylvan, uh, load items and uh, load item types. Oh, thanks, Rob. Yeah, um, you know, load items are, uh, you know, that's basically what we're utilizing the uh, sterilization process for. We're trying to get uh, those those items sterilized. And a very important first step is to uh, talk to the uh, appropriate uh, area that that's requiring the you know to have those items sterilized. So that could be your manufacturing area, your QC, your your lab uh, lab operations, etc. Um, you know, collect a list from them uh, and, and understand what it is that they plan to sterilize, and um, you know, build that list with their input. There might be certain items that they want to have done together you know, based on their operational needs. Um, but basically, what you'll find when you're putting the list together is that there's generally two main categories of items that will exist, and that is going to be your your harder, your wrapped goods, and then um, liquid items. So. The cycle development around both of those is going to be very different. So the types of things that would make up a, a hard or wrapped goods load would be things like hoses, glassware, stainless steel uh, components or containers, um, large carboys, et cetera. Um, those are things that are sterilized um, often with a, a pre-vacuum uh, or vacuum pulse built into the cycle. Uh, to help evacuate air that's actually very helpful with some of those items that are wrapped or when you have tubing uh, it'll help to remove air from some of those uh, difficult to penetrate or reach areas in the load so um, those things obviously are all put together and you build a, a load pattern or a load configuration from those the other larger category i mentioned uh, with liquids uh, those are like uh, as rob said your augers your broths your media uh, sterilization of, of those liquids and um, that often involves the use of a, a load probe that's actually placed in a liquid so it controls the cycle a little bit differently so there's actually a different cycle with different parameters that are involved there and also it's a little bit longer um, it takes longer because it doesn't um, you can have the result of having everything splatter everywhere if you change pressure too quickly while you have the hot liquids in the chamber and uh, it doesn't um, also typically involve those uh, that that pre-vacuum conditioning that the uh, that the other items did. And then sometimes there's oddball items that go in there and you just have to really, you know, understand what you're trying to achieve with that particular item, a uh, filter, for example, and design the cycle uh, for that appropriately. Um, so I'll, I'll kick it over to John next to talk about uh, load pattern uh, characteristics. All right, thanks, Ellen. If I can add one more thing is in the, in doing the, uh, the, the, the list, in a spreadsheet or what have you, because then you can group them and you can lodge, min, max, what have you. And then what I would always suggest is to go out and go shopping. You may have chosen to just say, oh, we always use one liter, done, always. But then somewhere along the way, if you got a two liter and you purchase that just for the validation of it, you've got it in there. So what I've always found is, you know, soon to finish the validation, somebody comes by and says, add this to it. Well, if you think about it ahead of time and you can minimize that, check off the list, save you a lot of time and energy. Uh, so as far as load patterns, so let's take a, let's look at the hot goods or liquid items, okay, for example, and determine what uh, what the end user would like for the easy, uh, basically for easy cycle, which is more flexible. So the fixed load, load is always going to be the same. 
same quantity, location, and the orientation, right? It's easy. Or the bracketing approach, the bracketing load, it can be a variation of the fixed load, okay? As a max with testing and utilize a min to accommodate the production requirements. You know, so it's kind of a variation on that. But then the bracketing load of any item, container, size, volume of liquid within the container, okay? So, but you do want to pay attention also to how the, the how to prepare the item uh, and establish your procedures. Avoid tinfoil, right? It just doesn't breathe. It's not permeable. But people think that's uh, that's cheap and it's easy to use. Realize when you've done sterilizing and you do loosely put the tinfoil out and you bring it into your non-sterile environment, it is going to cool off. And when it cools off, it takes that environment and contaminates your product. Hmm. So. Consider using the, the, the sterile type wrap. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Rob. Thank you, John. All right, and Tuan, uh, I'll talk about determining the approach for challenging load items. So that's up to you, and I'm gonna leave it with you for a moment here. So go ahead, Tuan. All right, thank you, Rob. Um, so after going through your load pattern characteristics and deciding what pattern is required for your process, uh, we move into this next phase of the psychedelic uh, phase, which is planning the approach for challenging the load items. Um, typically in this stage, the empty chamber mapping that we will later execute provides us with a lot of information to how we will challenge the load items, as this is where we will find out where our code spot is in the autoclave, which we discussed about a lot earlier. Um, this helps later in the execution stage, as it will help tell us the executors where to place our hardest to heat item. Um, based on this, in regards to cycle changes, we will determine if we want to increase exposure times or decrease exposure times based on the data we anal analyze, and whether we want to use an overkill approach that Rob talked about earlier, or a less conservative approach where we want to just to be sure to, to manually, manually meet the specifications and criteria we need uh, to meet to make the runs more efficient. Um, we also must plan for increasing or decreasing vacuum pulses based on what we observe is our e equilibration time as during the uh, um, ex exposure period, it may take a little bit longer for the um, autoclave to meet the, the sterilization hold that you need to, to meet your temperature and your lethality guidelines. Um, if we want to meet strict EN-285 regulations, we want to make sure we have enough vacuum process to maintain the sterilization temperature uh, we need during the entire uh, exposure phase. Um, this makes cycle development incredibly crucial as if we move forward with not having the parameters needed to meet um, the stringent EN 285 regulations or any other regulations that we're trying to meet, then we may get ourselves into a difficult, difficult deviation right up when we get into the PQ portion of the validation phase. Um, lastly, we want to look into the increasing exhaust or post conditioning times based on um, how long we want our load items to cool down or how long we, uh, we want them to dry based on when we want them removed. Um, when looking into liquid cycles specifically, Typically, these are a lot easier to develop as you're not dealing with vacuum pulses, and you only need to plan to test your load items based on the exposure time and how long it takes autoclaves to reach the temperature and uh, meet the mi minimum lethality you need. Um, next, in regards to looking at the approach for challenging load items based off statistical and physical analysis, um, typical approaches for challenging load items are commonly done through analyzing lethality or heat penetration and microbial or BI testing. Um, when using liquid cycles, you would typically use MPO PIs for your tests, whereas for vacuum or gravity cycles, you would typically use PI strips. Um, other uh, approaches also used in industry also involve uh, growth promotion, uh, pH testing, and filter integrity testing. I'm now going to pass it back to Rob, where he'll discuss the tools of the trade during the cycle development phase. Thank you, Tuan. All right. So yeah, so let's take a peek at this. And Andrew, if you have your pointer, um, let's start with the uh, we'll start with the feed through uh, port uh, that uh, Tuan had mentioned. Yep, there you go. Back uh, for OQ for being able to ingress your thermocouples. So this is uh, certainly a feed through port. A lot of sterilizers do have a port that has a sanitary connection. Here or not, if it doesn't have a sanitary connection, usually there's other ways that we can get in there and, and be able to hook up. Uh, contraptions such as this or something similar. Um, next, let's take a look at the data acquisition systems. There to the right, uh, we have uh, yeah, the B2K uh, that has a laptop with it, as well as the AVS, which is the, the newer branded model of the B2K. 
Right above that, um, there is, a, you can see the thermocouples on the cart, but then we have a little blow up of that thermocouple uh, right there, and that is a steam slice thermocouple. And a good question for Tuan here, what happens if you don't steam slice that thermocouple, Tuan? Great question, Rob. Um, it's in, extremely important in the process to make sure that you have steam slice thermocouples before running any autoclave cycles. As if they are not steam sliced, then moisture and water from the autoclave steam pressure may get into your sims. And if they get into your sims, they may end up damaging your validator, may end up damaging your sims, and it may adversely affect any autoclave runs you have conducted beforehand. Um, so great question. Um, we're going to pass it now on to John, and he's, he's going to discuss the pressure sensors and transducers used for um, autoclaves. Oh, thank you. On the pressure transducers, typically they're used in the EUN regulated uh, sterilization. Some companies uh, they take a look, they uh, look at temperature pressure through the correlation data, right? Uh, definitely consider when you do get the pressure transducers, consider the temperature compensation specifications on the transducer, because most transducers are designed to go up to 50 degrees. You're going to be putting them on a steam line that's going to go up to 120 something degrees it'll totally throw you off. So consider that definitely when you, when you, when you get them in there, you order them. All right, thank you. And Rob? Yeah, and actually, John, that, that is a great point. You and I had worked together years and years ago on a sterilizer, and uh, it's a good example that John's talking about. There was a mechanical space uh, that was uh, with the sterilizer, and it vented into that mechanical space. Well, that mechanical space had no louvers, so, as you can imagine, it heated up really well, and it skewed the numbers. So when you're trying to look at that uh, that correlation using those steam tables, it did not match. And, and what we what we ended up doing is we put a fan inside of it, and we put a fan to be able to just show, and everything then came right back in. It's so funny during the FAT and, and SAT, you know, uh, great. We put it into the wall, and they sealed it up, and it didn't work, and then they had to put louvers in. So it was uh, uh, it worked at that point. It was great. So at that mm -hmm. point we lesson. Uh, last but not least on this slide, um, Sylvan, can you talk about wireless sensors? Certainly. So uh, the ones there that you see, those small stainless steel devices there to the right of the feed through, those are data trace loggers. Um, you can use wireless systems in a sterilizer, um, but there are pros and cons, right? So they may be more convenient than having to run wires through a feed through, dealing with doing the additional leak tests, but they are battery powered devices. Um, you need to make sure, especially be, be very sure that the gaskets are uh, intact and that they're properly closed up. You don't want, don't want steam getting inside one of those things. It will destroy them. So uh, there's definitely some uh, preparation and care involved, but those are uh, the two items shown there. One is a temperature sensor and the one to the right is a pressure sensor. They're very capable of uh, providing uh, a sterilizer qualification for mapping. Uh, the one other thing to keep in mind too is you will not see real-time data with these. There are also RF options which provide radio frequency data in real time. But you know, question of whether or not you're going to get through the steel walls of a sterilizer, you may not be able to get all of your sensors to read through that, and you know, uh, to get out of that environment. Um, and uh, also, you know, just keep in mind that um, when you're running with wireless data loggers. You get a lot of flexibility in thermocouple. You can get into some tight spots when you're doing load mapping. You may not have as easy a time with a wireless data logger. There are ones with flexible tips, but they're definitely not as flexible um, as thermocouples are. So look at what you're trying to get done and just make sure you're choosing the right tool for the job. Okay, let's move on to uh, executing the plan. So a little bit more of the how uh, that is related to uh, cycle development. So Tuan, can you take it away? Yep, sure thing, Rob. So now we get into the next phase, uh, again, uh, of the autoclave cycle development, which is executing the plan that we put together. Um, based on what we discussed earlier, I want to reiterate again that the empty chamber mapping conducted using the defined cycle required is extremely important, as this is where we'll determine where our cold spot is for our hardest to heat load items. Um, after analyzing the results from the empty chamber mapping, we may want to keep the cycle as is if we're seeing passing results or we may want to increase or decrease the exposure time or vacuum pulses if we're seeing that our potential load items may need more time to equilibrate or reach our required sterilization hold temperatures. Um, it is important for us to define these testing criteria as they may make a large difference when analyzing the equilibration time for the sterilization hold, 
as well as when the accumulated vitality is met to meet your required sterility assurance level. Um, in regards to this phase, you want to document everything, whether it is planned or in the protocol, as the justifications on how you come up with your parameter durations are important for any audits, as well as later discovering any other ways you want to make your cycles more efficient. Um, Rob, can you tell us more about the load item mapping? Sure, sure. So, and Sylvan had mentioned this before, and so did John too, a little bit in, in their in their parts they talked about earlier. You know, you got to gather the load items from the end user. Uh, it is good. Like John said, if you got a one liter flask, but there's the potential that you could have a two or five liter flask, you know, might as well go in and go qualify it and get it get it done. So that way, you know, you got the maximum flexibility uh, there for yourself in the future. And it does buy it down from having to do a, a separate qualification uh, on those. So definitely gather those line items. And what we, what we suggest doing and recommend doing is uh, placing at least two sensors two thermocouples inside each load item when we're doing cycle development and then we're doing the uh the, the heat studies to be able to determine where those worst case spots within those load items are so at least two sometimes it's more than that but we'll use that data and that data will get used during pq because that's where we'll place our our thermocouple and our bis um, at that point so those are key document everything again that's huge and the other part with this is uh um, the use of that sterilization wrap, as John mentioned as well, you know, if you're preparing this type of stuff, you've got SOPs in place, uh, you know, you've got manufacturing techs or QC folks that are, that are putting it uh, putting it together, you know, steri sterilization wrap is, is good, the sterilization tape is good, the foil is, is not as good, um, believe me, it, it impedes steam penetration. The other thing you have to be careful of, and it could be guilty of a, a validation person doing it as well, is that if you put a sensor into a very small inner diameter, you're gonna you're gonna inhibit steam flow that way too. So you have to be careful of a lot of different things when when you're looking at it. But it is key to to try and map those load items and get the worst case spot. All right, so that is uh, that is executing and the how. Let's talk about uh, analyzing the data. And Silver, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Yes. So um, obviously. The cycle data is really important. It's important to look at it once you uh, have finished your runs uh, and you want to assess that data to see if your cycle performed as you expected it to. Um, if uh, all of your you know, parameters uh, gave you good results, um, for example, you know, um, if you're looking for equilibration, if you're trying to meet that tight European spec, um, did you get there? Um, are you close? You may need to increase your vacuum pulses, for example, uh, if, if you're not quite getting the result that you want. Um, basically, when it when it comes to the load items, you know you want to look at the location of your sensors, and then also look at that accumulated lethality data uh, that you you know lethality for each of those uh, probe locations in the load items. So, if um, you've got BIs present, if you included those in your cycle development, certainly you know check to see that your BIs were also inactivated, and uh, keep in mind that that can add some time. Right, you're kind of the cycle development process. You're trying to you know get your cycle figured out, but um, if you have to wait for BIs, you know, plan for that time. And then also, you know, look at that data and use it to determine where those hardest to heat locations are. You might have to run several cycles to actually get that figured out. Um, the idea is really that we want to have a robust uh, qualification. So, you know, make sure that you're comfortable, you've collected enough data with those developmental runs, and then you'll have a very good idea of where you want to put your thermal couples and your BIs when you're doing your actual PQ runs. So, um, you know, use that information as well to determine if you have to adjust your sterilization times. Uh, you know, you might want to decide to increase your exposure to make sure you're, uh, so, you know, have a very comfortable margin of, of, of achieving the lethality that you want. Okay, great. Uh, so, John, using the results. Well, by bracketing your load items and combining your like cycles, You'll have minimized your potential cycle count, all right? therefore less cycles, less confusion, less errors. Every account always wants minimum amount of cycles because the last thing you want to have is you put the wrong load into, you press the wrong button, everything looks good, and you have a failure. So that's not it. Then the other is you can leverage the development results, as Sylvan was saying, for the worst case loads, you know, for your future requalification programs or your continuous verification. We know that this is the hottest heat cycle 
that's the one you want to requalify next year or or on a shorter circuit shorter cycle okay so that that's that's the recommendations how to utilize the the results great thank you john all right uh so we're up to the recommendations piece of this slide here so Certainly coming out of cycle development, uh, your, your next step is a PQ is, is doing your thermal mapping with uh, you know, heat penetration studies and, and biological indicator studies. That's the next piece. I guess uh, I just want to ask one question here, uh, and I'll ask of you, Silman, you know, have you seen common failures, uh, testing experiences there that, that uh, you might have one to share there too? Uh, sure. Um, you have... Uh... You know, smaller orifices, I think we mentioned that already, you know, achieving steam penetration into those areas can be difficult. Uh, you know, sometimes you've got somebody that wants to sterilize a 20 foot long segment of tubing with like a, you know, a five millimeter inner diameter or something that's probably not going to do well. <laughs> so uh, there's ways around that, you know, maybe you can segment the tubing and, you know, connect it with a, with a sterile hose barb, something like that. But yeah, there's definitely... Um, you know, there's definitely some issues. Containers as well, I'm placed up right inside of uh, uh, the chamber during sterilization. Uh, surprisingly, you know, if you don't get that that evacuation and that steam to, to re, you know, replace the the, the uh, air that's inside that container, you'll have issues there as well. Yeah, orientation is key. Twan or, or John, you want to add to that? Yeah, and just, just to add in with what uh, Sivan's point is, you want to look into the load item orientation as well. Um, if you're having items stacked on top of each other, it may make it even harder for um, steam to, to to sip through to what whatever items you need to get uh, sterilized. So mm -hmm. that's another point uh, to look into. Yeah, and and one of the earlier pictures that had the sterilizer there, there's an observation where it had uh, it should be papered down so that any moisture or water can actually run down through it. Where if it's papered down, plastic down. It'll pool up in there, and then that's a, that's a, that's a no no. That's one. And the other is I absolutely have to emphasize what Sylvan had mentioned was to be calibrated properly prior to doing the testing. And I've had too many failures when it's been calibrated, checked. Yes, you do the IQ. Yes, it's been calibrated, and you find the results are totally skewed off, and that's that's devastating. As in any validation effort. Thank you. Very true. All right, Andrew, we're gonna kick this back to you. All right, thanks, Rob. So um, great presentation. Uh, hopefully everybody learned uh, a lot here. Um, so we're at the uh, top of the hour. Um, so we do have a number of um, audience questions here. Um, so we'll, we'll go through and get started on that. Um, you can stick around, you know, awesome. Um, if people have to go, um, we are at the top of the hour, which is uh, what we scheduled it for. Um, so we want to respect uh, everybody's time. Um, with that said, we'll get into it. Um, so we have the full panel uh, to answer these questions. And then we also have uh, calling in here, um, our own Derek Collins, who is um, one of our uh, sterilizer subject matter experts. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's uh, let's go through some of these. So. Um, First one here, uh, what can a client do to prepare better uh, for having the testing completed? Do we need to provide anything uh, for you? Um, so this would be if they were getting it uh, done by a third party provider. Yeah, I'll take that one, I'll take that one to start, I guess. Um, so yeah, so definitely load items being provided. Uh, if we're starting with protocol, we're going to need the URS. We're going to need to know what you're looking to sterilize, how are you looking to sterilize it, and uh, what uh, what approach you're taking, as well as what you're what you're following for regulations. Uh, so that way we know your acceptance criteria. That's that's going to be key. But definitely having your load items would help us uh, move it quicker, right? So that way, as these guys were talking about earlier, is is building that Excel spreadsheet, of basically of all your load items and figuring out what you have. And then uh, trying to mold it all into into one. Do you guys have uh, something else you'd add to it too? If, if I could, you want you, if you want to leverage some of the information, some of the testing that you might have done, or maybe what you have been how you have been running it. Okay, so that we have the cycles that you were using, the load items that you're using, 
and we won't put that as a format as a, in the template of what we want to utilize and then we'll go from there because there's experience that some of the SMEs will put together and say that might be marginal or something but that's the starting and baseline to, to, to work with yeah I'll jump in too you know making sure that your sterilizer is actually designed for the type of work that you're looking to do uh, you're running liquid loads and your sterilizer does not have a load probe uh, that's an issue and also um, if you don't have uh, a vacuum sterilizer if it's a gravity machine only that's really going to limit uh, your ability to get effective steam penetration so you know looking at the actual autoclave that uh, and its capabilities against what you're trying to get done is very important also so um, I think this might have been mentioned before but get get somebody with the validation background involved early on because they can save you some heartache if you get down further in the process and then discover your machine's not capable of doing the work that you, you need it to do. Yeah, what and do to add into, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, and to add on to Sylvan's point, again, with checking the, the satellites to make sure it's something that you want beforehand because there's a couple times where I went into qualify a sterilizer that was brand new and it would break down after one run. So you wanna make sure that the manufacturer runs some runs on it before um, they release it to you because you wanna make sure that all the components and everything involved in it are working properly as well. Excellent. Um, uh, next question here. Um, you were saying that a vacuum leak test should be done after installing non-wireless thermocouples. Uh, is that correct? And is the Bowie Dick test enough, um, or is that something different? Uh, if I could, if you want to do the vacuum leak test prior to doing any uh, breaking of any penetrations, right? Because you want to know that it actually was was suitable. It was uh, it was tight to begin with. You have a baseline, then you open it up, put the penetrations in, then you do a test, and then you have a comparison. Because uh, all of us have run a, chased our tail by testing it after you put the penetration in, finding out it's it's leaking, take it all apart and find out after you try to solve it that it wasn't anything you've done. There was leaks already in there. So that's just a, a good practice. <laughs> and as far as the Bowie Dick test, that's an additional test, but you still need to do should you your leak test to begin with. Excellent. Thank you, John. So we'll just go through maybe a couple of more of these and then um, any we don't get to, uh, we'll follow up with um, the person who asked the question uh, so we can get you the info that you need. Um, so the second to last question here, uh, for fluid loads, how would you bracket a small quantity of large volumes or a large quantity of small volume or a mix of the two? So what are kind of the differences between those scenarios? Um, I'll jump in. One uh, more time. I we'll think that's done. where cycle development is important. So you'd want to probe each one of those and see, you know, what you're looking at. Um, the one thing about having a load probe is that it uh, does not start the sterilization hold until that liquid actually achieves sterilization temperature. So, um, but what you can obviously accomplish when you have a data logging system is you can uh, set up a load with those different sized containers and respective volumes and see out of all of those different types that you have, also keeping in mind your warmest and coldest locations in the chamber too, right? You don't, you don't want to ignore that. Um, so kind of everything needs to be done with that worst case uh, scenario in mind. But you collect enough data so that you understand how each one of those is different in terms of, you know, with the heat up time. And uh, you can you can look at the data afterwards and and basically build your uh, your cycle based on that. You want a cycle that's going to be um, sufficient for your worst case load item, which is likely to be the largest volume. But again, data will tell you for sure. You don't have to guess. So you'd want to use your development runs to determine uh, what your time needs to be for exposure to to get your sterilization. Right. And, and to add to that, um, if you are using a large load and a small load, let's say of water, okay, exactly, but what someone's saying, if you're using a large load and a small load uh, uh, with uh, something that's heat, uh, heat uh, impactful, that's going to be a problem because a small, will, like a like an agar or something like that, the smaller item will have burnt and, and been no longer viable. So that's uh, you have to consider. 
Right. Uh, thanks, John. We'll do uh, one more. And again, we have several additional ones that um, we'll follow up with uh, after. So this is a good one here. And I think this might uh, help a lot of people out. Um, what do you mean by increasing vacuum pulses? Uh, longer or higher pressure and negative or positive pulses? Derek with thoughts? us? This is a great one for Derek. All right, I guess I'll take this one. Um, the, the short answer is, is yes, all of those. Um, you can, depending on what the results are, are of your initial testing on your cycle development, on uh, seeing how well your load items equilibrate, uh, then you would look at adding pulses or increasing the depth of the vacuum in the initial pulses to remove as much air as possible. Um, I mean, in general, most cycles, I can, I can usually get away with about four negative pulses. Um, but I have seen, you know, autoclaves with difficult, difficult to sterilize load items. I've seen some that have up to, that'll, that have had up to six negative pulses and seven or eight positive pulses just to get everything preconditioned and guarantee that you meet that equilibration. All right. Thank you, Derek. So that's um, all the time we have for uh, the Q&A piece, at least you know, live on the webinar here. Um, so we'll wrap things up. So uh, thanks to all the, the panelists and um, thanks to everyone uh, who attended this webinar. Um, we hope you got a lot of uh, great information uh, out of this. It's um, you know, a very broad topic, um, but we covered um, you know, a ton of ground, which is excellent. Um, so free to field to contact us, um, you know, via our website, uh, or email or call us. Um, we'll be happy to answer, uh, any of your, uh, questions about any of the topics we, uh, talked about today. And, um, just a quick reminder in the uh, download section, you'll be able to download, uh, Derek's, uh, white paper on steam quality testing, uh, as well as a PDF version of, um, uh, this presentation today and I was close out with saying that um, you will receive a uh, an email within uh, 24 hours um, with the recording of this webinar and you also get a uh, email with a very short four question survey um, we like to get feedback about you know what works what didn't and we'll also ask you about um, other topics that you would like to see in future webinars so Again, thanks for everyone for attending and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank Andrew. you all. Take care.